Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. Today I thought we could look at this book about Mooka. I think he's considered Art Nouveau, but we'll find out. So this book was published in 2007. Rosalind Ormiston. And I really like the way they used this sort of Art Nouveau font here. Very cool. This is really cool. I love even the detail here on the side of the leaves. And I love the color scheme. It's muted, you know, but still very vibrant. I'll do my usual disclaimer of saying I do not speak Czech and I'm going to mispronounce a lot of stuff, I'm sorry. The name of the Czech artist Alphonse Muka, 1860 to 1939, is synonymous with the Stil Muka, a decorative art form that made the artist famous in Paris at the end of the 19th century. Today, Alphonse Mucha is recognized for the bridge he created between high art and commercialism. Mucha was able to straddle both worlds to create an artwork that could be used for a poster illustration for cigarettes and at the same time produce a series of historical paintings such as the Slav epic, which remains a powerful contribution to Czech art history. A study of Mucha's life allows one to fully explore and understand the context of Paris at the Fin de Siècle, a fabulous period to be an artist if you were successful, appallingly hard if your work was not recognized. Mucha lived and worked in Paris for nearly 20 years, from 1887 to 1906. This book, in two sections, aims to reveal Alphonse Mucha through explorations of his life and his work. The first section will take the reader from his birth in 1860 in the tiny town of Ivan Cisse, I don't know, in Bohemia to his death in Prague in 1939, where hundreds of thousands of mourners gathered to pay their respects. The second section concentrates on his masterworks created during his most influential period, 1893 to 1903, when his innovative graphic design, collectively called Le Style Mucha, emerged in Paris. In 1887, Mucha moved to Paris to study as an artist, at first as the protege of a wealthy patron, and when financial backing ceased, as an impoverished artist living on a diet of beans and lentils, enduring cold winters and bare accommodation. When fame came to him, he shared it with his less fortunate friends, he was a generous man who never forgot his own periods of hardship. His chance at fame came through a rush job to create a graphic design for a theater poster for the globally famous actress Sarah Bernhardt. She liked his work and signed a six-year contract guaranteeing him success. It is perhaps because Mucha's success was gained through commercial illustration that he is not immediately linked to other artists of the period, like Paul Cezanne, Claude Monet, or Edgar Degas. Yet Mucha, like fellow graphic illustrators Henri Toulouse-Lautrec and Zul Chere, was creating art in the context of life in Paris. Their illustrations are a historically important document of graphic design of the era. During Mucha's time in Paris, the now-revered artist Cezanne lived and worked in Aix-en-Provence. He had independent means. He could afford to paint what he wanted. Mucha, without a patron, needed to find work. The growth in the publishing industry required illustrators. 
It was his means of survival. His peak years, 1893 to 1903 in Paris, perfectly encapsulate the fin de siècle era. As a young man, Mucha stated that his three major interests were the church, music, and art. He also believed in fate. In his memoirs, he refers to three life-changing events. The first happened in a church in Moravia. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that town. Where he saw the work of local artist Johann Umlauf, respected for his work. Mucha realized that could be him. The second was a chance meeting with Count Kuhn Balazi, Balazi, who eventually became his benefactor in Paris. He had taken a snap decision to get off a train in Mikulov, which led to a job working for the Count. The third was being in the right place at the right time. A rush job for poster illustration for Sarah Bernhardt was given to him. It made him instantly famous and wealthy and placed him at the center of the Parisian art world. Others may see these occasions as the result of his perseverance to establish himself as an artist and taking every and any opportunity put his way. Whether luck or fate, neither would have been of use had Mucha not been a highly gifted artist. It's hard to see because of the glare, but... Actually, the light in this is so beautiful. This little area. Mucha's skill as a decorative designer is supremely illustrated in his designs for the Fouquet Jewelry Boutique in Paris. They stand as a spectacular reminder of Alphonse Mucha's extraordinary skills in decorative design, as exemplary of Le Steel Mucha as his posters and decorative panels. His astounding popularity in Paris meant non-stop commissions for commercial work, producing posters, decorative panels, magazine covers, jewelry design, and sculpture, all in the steel mucha, and all of which left him desirous for a change. The steel mucha influenced many, but mucha refused to align himself to any particular group. He would not be drawn toward the symbolists, romantics, or surrealists. After years at a pinnacle of creativity in Paris, he moved to New York to remove himself from the commercial aspect of his work. He involved himself in teaching at the Chicago Institute of Art, a chance meeting, perhaps fate, playing a part again, with art millionaire and American diplomat Charles R. Crane, sealed his ambition to paint a patriotic portrayal of his homeland. Thus was born the plans for the Slav epic a series that would take Mucha many years to complete. Its subject matter of Slavic mythology and history was not embraced by all Czechs. It was never to find a permanent home in the capital city. It was eventually installed in a distant castle in Moravsky Krumlov amongst his Moravian countrymen. The Slav epic remains his most potent work but his sensational series of posters, advertisements, and decorative panels, plus his theatrical posters for Sarah Bernhardt, all created between 1893 and 1903, guarantee his unending fame and an unrivaled place in the arts world. motifs in these pieces is so gorgeous. This almost looks kind of 70s. A little bit about his upbringing. So this town that Muka grew up in was one of the most significant in Moravia. In the medieval period, it was a fortified town its location at the intersection of three rivers made it target of many raids and skirmishes. Its significance grew, and with it, a basilica and gothic castle. It fell into the hands of Hungarian Kumans in the 14th century and the Hussites in the 15th century. I don't know if I'm pronouncing any of that right. Sorry. In the Battle of White Mountain in 1620, Moravia, together with Bohemia, lost its religion and independence. But by the 18th century, 
It had its own cultural identity once more. It was the base of the unity of the brethren and a center for the Czech brothers' institutions. It was a town steeped in history, which in some ways trapped it as a backwater, living through an era that was rapidly changing and yet hardly touched by progress or modernity. At the time of Mucha's birth, many changes were taking place in Europe. In 1848, the Austrian monarchy became the head of an alliance between Austria and Hungary. In his homeland, the people of Moravia were fighting hard to maintain their independence alongside Bohemia and Silesia, or Silesia, but all in vain. This resulted in Moravia turning more toward the Slavic nation of, in Russia. As a young child, Muka witnessed skirmishes at first hand during the Austro-Prussian War of 1866, when soldiers were fighting in his hometown. He observed and mentally recorded the colors of the uniforms, the sounds of guns, and death in the streets. The turmoil of battles for control of his homeland tied him emotionally to Moravian traditional folklore with its Slavic patriotism and religious practice. Here's some posters. Looks like these represent seasons. We have spring, summer, autumn, and winter. It's so cool to see the fine detail of these. It always looks like digital the different textures, almost like a collage. The face is really beautiful there, and all the patterns. He was a theatrical scene painter for a while at the Ring Theater in Vienna until his employer, his employer lost a major account. Muka had spent his time in Vienna furthering his artistic studies, widening his knowledge of paint pigments and techniques, learning to work in gouache and tempera. Gouache was to become his favorite medium for illustration. Although precipitated by disaster, Muka was ready for the next stage of his fledgling artistic career. I wish I had a better understanding of mediums. I feel like Serious artists always have such a strong grasp on, you know, their tools and their supplies. That's really gorgeous too. This is called Dawn from 1898. So at the age of 27, Mocha arrived in Paris the cultural heart of the art world, and a city much changed in the last 30 years. In 1853, Napoleon III employed Baron Georges Eugène, Eugène Osman to modernize Paris. Medieval blocks of houses, lived in by the poorer members of Parisian society, were demolished in order to widen the streets and allow any disorder to be quelled by the horse cavalry. To complement the new wide boulevards, Osman ordered new parks, new places to stroll, ride, or travel by carriage to be created. New open-air cafes, such as in the Tuileries Gardens, were placed in the parks to cater for public entertainment. The new Paris created a sense of modernity for Parisians. The new railway stations and train lines took Parisians to the countryside on their days off. 
All this, the parks, gardens, boulevards, concerts, railways, boating on the Seine, bourgeois families, entertainers, all was captured on canvas by the Parisian painters of modern life. It's worth establishing here the kind of arts world in which Mukha was about to immerse himself. From before his birth, the early stages of the rebellion against the arts establishment in Paris were underway. The Academy Royale was established in 1648 and had been disbanded in 1793 during the French Revolution. The new Academy des Beaux-Arts quickly re-established itself in the tradition of conventional types of painting, still life, landscape, genre, portraits, and historical subjects. French artist Gustave Courbet rejected the establishment rules and in consequence his paintings were rejected from the Universal Exposition of 1855. In defiance, he set up his own pavilion of realism. He stated that there can be no schools, there are only painters. The arts establishment chose to ignore the social realism of his heroic large-scale paintings, such as The Stone Breakers, or Funeral at Ornan. By 1863, the number of paintings being refused by the Academy led to growing discontent among artists keen to break away from traditional teachings. The same year, Charles Baudelaire, an art critic, published an essay, The Painter of Modern Life, in the French newspaper Le Figaro, using modernité, modernité to describe the difference between the modern and the established. Paintings such as Edouard Manet's controversial Le Déjeuner Solaire were mocked by the establishment a little bit about this era in Paris and some of the painters that were working. Monet, Morisot, Renoir, Serra. Discussion about Le Grand Jatte, which you remember if you watched Ferris Bueller's Day Off. about Emile Zola, who we've talked about before. The era of the, the Flaneurs, which are the people at social gadflies, kind of wandering around Paris. This is cool. Is this something about royalty? Or, oh no, it's an ad for Nestle. Advertisements used to be more grand. <laughs> this almost looks like the profiles used in currencies. These are so neat. Some boxes with his designs on them. Biscuit Champagne. Champagne biscuits or champagne cookies? What's that? This is a little bit about his patronage and ability to have some freedom to study because he was funded. Mother Czech artists in Paris at the time. Some more panels of different flower types. Rose, iris, and carnation, lily. The composition in these um, pieces is always so thoughtful. The use of like negative space here. This kind of abundant detail down here. He knew Paris well and could speak French fluently. He chose a different location for his rented room, this time at number one, Rue Joseph Parra, near the Jardin de Luxembourg in the Latin Quarter, the Quartier Latin. This is a 
bike advertisement, I think. This is the full size and this is the close up. Look at all that hair. Everything makes a design in these art pieces. friends with Gauguin. He was drawn toward a circle of friends interested in religious mysticism and symbolism, the occult and secret society. Interesting. I feel like a lot of Art Nouveau is referenced these days in paintings about the occult. Sarah Bernhardt, the actress who he painted um, posters for, sorry. Okay, these pieces are part of a menu for Monet et Chandon, or sorry, Monet et Chandon. I don't know what connection that is to the champagne. These little circle details here, it's amazing. It's blown up. It's stunning. It's stunning how like these, I know I say everything is stunning and I'm sorry. Um, but I love harmonious design and this piece just, it keeps your eye moving. You just keep seeing new things you want to, you want to look at. You can be moving around this wheel and you'll see, oh, there's a bird or Look at the flowers in her hair. Look at this drapery around her waist. Look at how this is a design that becomes a bouquet of flowers. Like, it's amazing. I'm really sorry about the glare here. Wow, look at that one. So this series is times of day, and it moves sequentially. It's morning, noon, evening, and night. They're 107 centimeters by 59 centimeters, or 42 inches by 15 inches, so they're pretty big. to design jewelry for Georges Fouquet or George Fouquet. It says George here and then Georges here, so I don't know. One of Mucha's most stunning and enduring legacies is his creative work for the exclusive jewelry shop of Fouquet in Paris. Georges Fouquet, a young Frenchman, had taken over the business in 1895, when his father, Alphonse Fouquet, an accomplished, gifted goldsmith, retired. Fouquet wanted to revitalize the shop with modern, extravagant jewelry to move away from his father's neo-Renaissance style. Fouquet and Mucha both embraced the new spirit of Parisian Art Nouveau. Fouquet's commission was a step away from poster illustration toward a use of Mucha's decorative design skills in metal. I wonder if they have any examples. This is a design for a fan. Very cool. Wow. If you guys can see the little veils or mantillas or whatever these are, but they're so detailed. All these women. That's a really famous image. So in 1904, Mucha left Paris for New York. He was famous in America. 
His name was known through his commercial work, particularly for Sarah Bernhardt. The poster illustrations he had created for her had been used to advertise her tour of the U.S. His arrival was celebrated with an illustrated feature in the Sunday Supplement edition of the New York Daily News. It reproduced in full color friendship commissioned by the newspaper. The lithograph featured female personifications of France as an older woman with her arm around the shoulder of a younger woman symbolizing America. <laughs> it portrayed the bond of friendship between the two countries. The layers of design, like you have this woman in the foreground and then the smoke kind of going behind her and then the text and then this other pattern happening back here in the far background. This is so much thought into everything. This one's just called Job. This is an advertisement for one of Muka's exhibitions. It says, His quest for historic material for the Slav epic took Muka to Russia in April 1913. He wanted to illustrate the momentous decision by Tsar Alexander II to abolish serfdom. His plan was to show peasants gathered near St. Basil's Cathedral to hear the declaration read out, an event which happened in 1861. Muka took photographs of the architecture of the square and St. Basil's, and of people sitting and standing on steps and at corners. For the tableau, he wanted to capture the reaction of the people when they heard that they would no longer be serfs, a mixture of stunned bewilderment and excited confusion mixed with indifference. He took photographs of local people in the square, he then traveled in the countryside, photographing peasants, young and old. Whilst in Russia, Muka discovered that his own designs were being taught in art schools in Moscow, where they were used to define Slavonic traditional design, which pleased Muka greatly. On the 15th of March, 1939, the German army invaded Czechoslovakia. Muka was 75 and in failing health. He was a resident of Prague and a known supporter of the Jewish community. He had suffered libelous accusations in fascist-run newspapers and was one of the first to be interrogated by the Gestapo. He was released after questioning, but the experience weakened him. Four months later, on the 14th of July, he died. The German authorities would not allow a state funeral. The priest who had witnessed his wedding would not conduct the service due to Muka's involvement with the Masonic Society. Eventually, he was buried in Prague, the same cemetery as many famous artists. In spite of a ban imposed by the German authorities on demonstrations or mass gatherings, crowds of hundreds of thousands came to pay their respects to Muka. Amazing the amount of detail on these faces. Oh, this is a poster for Sarah Bernhardt. Oh, wow, these are cool. Look at this drapery. Following the success of the Gizmonda portrayal, Muka made a small pencil drawing of Bernhardt playing the lead role of the Florentine merchant prince Lorenzo de' Medici. 
Her dark hair is short. She looks pensive, staring up to the right, beyond the viewer. Her hand is close to her mouth. Her character is contemplating the assassination of Duke Alexander. For the finished lithograph of Bernhardt as, Loren as Lorenzaccio in 1896, she stands, legs crossed, leaning against an arched framework. The serpentine shape of her body is accentuated by the somber color of the belted tunic, flowing cloak, tights, and shoes. This must be Macbeth or Hamlet, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Hamlet. More seasons. Oh, these are beautiful. These are um, more seasons, but it's very kind of Japanese in the company. They almost look like they're from a graphic novel from this year. They're from 1902. This is to symbolize the planets. So dark, it's kind of hard to see. Okay. 8280. Let's see if we can find it. It's about the epic, but 181 maybe? so you guys can see it. Thank you so much for taking the time to look at this book with me and let me know if you're interested in more Art Nouveau because I have another book. It's a little bit older. It is black and white, so it's not, the pictures aren't as good. Well, there's a few. That's a peacock room. Actually so cool. I think that's what it is. Yeah, the Peacock Room of the Leyland Residence. They recreated this in the Freer Gallery in DC. If you ever go there, I highly recommend it. It's really cool. But yeah, we can look at this if you want. Um, I would also like to look at um, Toulouse Lautrec. He's one of my favorites. So let me know. And I know I need to get some more books. Thank you so much again, and I'll see you next time.